Well, good morning, everyone. I, I was coming from Dollingstown, and Dollingstown is 35 degrees and full sunshine. And then, <laughs> gone off. And then, just as I was driving from Dollingstown towards Marilyn, it's raining. I can't understand this. And it's only on Northern Ireland where you're coming from 35 to suddenly the temperatures have dropped to almost to five. Have you seen that? Maybe you need to travel to Dollingstown. But my advice is don't go because it's exactly the same. From yesterday, we had a brilliant summer almost. And then today, it's winter. And it's trying to remember where is the fun in the weather, the way it fluctuates between one to the other. However, as you have come to him uh, this morning, there's this wonderful um, verse in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, which should be, in a sense, our welcome. Welcome to each one of you, but also welcome to the guys online. This applies to all of us. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and, to in, and into his marvelous light. So knowing that this is who we welcome to, why not turn to the person next to you, behind you, and just say good morning, welcome, and tell them one exciting thing that you have done this week. On you go. <laughs> So, so it's quite exciting. And this side, and this side of the church, no, no very exciting as things have happened this week. But in this side, I can hear chattering and excitement. So for those online, I know it's very difficult for you to actually talk to someone because you may just be by yourself. But for us here is an excitement when we come to God's house to be able to share things, to be able to come into God's presence, to be able to just to focus on this aspect of God choosing us, him identifying each person and bringing each one of us to himself. Everything that's on the screen in bold is your responses. And everything else, I will help you from the front. But just as you are aware, are as a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, for the reason that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, let us say to the Lord, praise the Lord, the God of Israel. He alone does marvelous things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let his glory fill the earth. Amen. Well, let us stand up and praise him to this wonderful tune, Praise the Lord, the Almighty. Let us stand as we worship him.
You may sit as we come to that part of our service of confession. We take time to reflect on some of the things that we have done throughout this week. Things that we have done against God, against our neighbor, or even against our family. The gospel calls us to turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. As we offer ourselves to him in penitence and faith, we renew our confidence and trust in his mercy. Lord God, our maker and our redeemer, this is your world and we are your people. Come among us and save us. For we have willfully misused your gifts of creation. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have seen the ill treatment of others and have not gone to their aid. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have condoned evil and dishonesty and failed to strive for justice. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have heard the good news of Christ, but have failed to share it with others. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. We have not loved you with all our heart, nor our neighbor, neighbors as ourselves. Lord, be merciful. Forgive us our sin. May the God of all healing and forgiveness draw us to himself and cleanse us from all our sins, that we may behold the glory of his Son, the Word made flesh, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We will shortly start to sing, but during the next song, children and youth leave for their activities. And just before they go, let us uh, pray for them. Father, we entrust our children and our youth into the hands of those who are teaching them. May you take the word through the Holy Spirit and plant it deep within their hearts and minds so that as they grow, as they have fun, as they seek to be where you have placed them to be, they may remember who Jesus is for them and that your spirit reminds them daily of what you continue to do in them. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as we worship Jesus, hope of the nations. Let us stand.
you. You may sit as we come to our prayers. You may sit. Your response to the Lord in your mercy is hear our prayers. Let us pray. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by man, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Christ being the resurrection and the king of our lives. In him we have discovered that death has been defeated and his living hope bursts brightly than the morning sun. From early rise to the last sunset of the day, we praise and magnify your glorious name. For as we come to him, the living stone, we as your people go forth to tell others that Christ, our risen King, has conquered death and he reigns forevermore. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, the resurrection of King Jesus impacts all of humanity, all of life. Life in the open, life in our homes, lives in our workplace, life when we are in a neighborhood. In this, the risen King who reigns in our hearts and who is enthroned on high, may he rule in the hearts and minds of all our families in the parish. We pray that each family, in whatever shape or form, from the youngest to the oldest, from the healthiest to the most fragile, or the most bruised, may each encounter the resurrected King and delight in his presence, the one who is the living stone in whom all stones are held together. May each family discover that the King of the earth loves them to bits, that the King of the whole universe cares for them immensely, and may they find in him the light as they come into his presence. Lord, in your mercy. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to him, the living King, the living stone, we as living stones learn that you have revealed the risen Christ to those vulnerable women, scared and perplexed, you have revealed Christ to vulnerable people, people who did not deserve to be in your kingdom, to encounter him. You have revealed him as the living stone to all those who responded to you. That as they discover Jesus, who broke out of death, and with a mighty blow burst out of the grave with power and glory. We pray this morning for all those who are in nursing homes, for all those who are homebound, that they might too know the power of the living Christ, the living stone. And as they are in nursing homes or homebound, may they know that the risen Christ is also their living stone, and that they too, like us, are living stones part of the same building that you are building and you are investing yourself into. May they know that the mighty power of the risen Christ also draws near them and with love stronger and mightier than death, that love covers them and reminds them that you are alive and present in their context as much as you are in ours. Lord, in your mercy, Dear Heavenly Father, the world that does not accept the resurrected Christ as the living stone does live in darkness, in the graveyard of the ruler of this world, where through death he has hidden the light of Christ from all of humanity. May this morning, through the power of your Holy Spirit, 
May you enter homes through people like us to reveal your glory and the mighty works of salvation that have been done through Christ. May in the coming months, and especially as we are thinking of the summer mission in the week of June, may that as we, each one of us, enter into the homes of other people, knock on their doors, invite them to different things, may they too experience the power of the resurrection, the invitation to come and to be part of a living project that God is building with Christ being the head, living stone, and to give life where life has been drawn out. May you give each one of us the boldness and the courage to speak up for Jesus, to get out into the graveyard of the world, and to rescue people from death. For Father, the resurrection of Christ reminds us of the boldness of life everlasting, of an explosion of love and grace from above. For it reminds us of a love that leaves the tomb empty and the risen King alive. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, we draw our prayers as we are bringing our friends, our family members, our colleagues, people that we care for and whom we want to bring before you by naming them now. Heavenly Father, in Christ's name, we bring them before your throne, entrusting each person, each family, each person named into your hands and under the care of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we bring all these things. Amen. Amen. We now stand and affirm our faith, and the words should be on the screen. Let us stand. Let us declare our faith in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ died for our sins. In accordance with the scriptures, he was buried, he was raised to life on the third day, in accordance with the scriptures. Afterwards, he appeared to his followers and to all the apostles. This we have received, and this we believe. Amen. You may sit as Judith comes to bring our reading. This morning's reading comes from Exodus chapter 29, verses 1 to 12 and verse 21. Now this is what you shall do to them to consecrate them, that they may serve me as priests. Take one bull of the herd and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil, and unleavened wafers smeared with oil. You shall make them of fine wheat flour. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket and bring the bull and the two rams. You shall bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Then you shall take the garments and put on Aaron the coat and the robe of the ephod and the ephod and the breastpiece and gird him with the skillfully woven band of the ephod. And you shall set the turban on his head and put the holy crown on the turban. You shall take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. Then you shall bring his sons and put coats on them. And you shall gird Aaron and his sons with sashes and bind caps on them. And the priesthood shall be theirs by a statute forever. Thus you shall ordain Aaron and his sons. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. Aaron, <coughs> excuse me, Aaron and his sons, <coughs> excuse me. Then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. 
Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. Then you shall kill the bull before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of the meeting, and shall take part of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger, and the rest of the blood you shall pour out at the base of the altar. Then you shall take part of the blood that is on the altar and of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and his sons' garments with him. He and his garments shall be holy and his sons and his garments with him. This is the word of the Lord. We have Ken now uh, this morning, and he's going to take us through this wonderful passage. Ken, there is a mic for you, and can I pray for you? Yes, please do. A Romanian praying for a professor of the Church of Ireland. Father God, we thank you so much that you have brought people from different places and to come and to learn under the tutorage, tutorage of this your man. May, we open, may you open our hearts and our minds and plant your word deep within us so that as we go, we will put things into practice. So let your spirit be with Ken. May he be aware that from the bottom of his heart to the head to the toe, as you have ordained and set apart your priest, you may set him apart as he teaches us, as your priesthood, being set apart for the task of going into the world and getting the world excited for you. So we pray in Jesus, give you thanks for all things. Amen. Thank you. I'm on now. Oh, poor you. <laughs> um, I didn't realize I'd been promoted. Uh, what an introduction, brother. Yeah. Um, especially this morning, because I want to be honest with you, I actually, for the first time maybe in my whole ministry, I don't know where I'm going with this this morning. Now, I have to say that God created in his own, us in his own image, but that person has no sense of timing because at bedtime, bedtime last night, I was all ready for this morning's service, everything done and dusted, sermon notes all printed, prayed over them, and then about four o'clock this morning, he lays something on my heart. And I felt like saying, Lord, okay, I might do, but you could have made it just a, a, a wee bit earlier. Um, but anyway, that combined with the fact that when Simon uh, gave me the portion of scripture for this morning, I thought he was playing a joke on me. Because when he said Exodus 29, I looked up on my laptop and my Bible, and um, I read the second screen on the, on the, on the, on the laptop, and I kid you not, this is what I read. This is what Simon seemed to be giving me. Take the other ram, slaughter it, take some of its blood and put it on the lobes of the right ears of Aaron and his sons, on the thumbs of their right hands, and on the big toes of, toe of their right feet. Then splash blood against the sides of the altar. Take from this ram the fat, the fat tail, the fat of the internal organs, the long lobe of the liver, both kidneys with fat on them, and the right thigh. This is the ram for ordination. Back you're looking forward to this. I had visions of uh, the temple priests officiating at the sacrifice with a, sort of the recipe book out in front of them. You put the right thigh in, you take the, left, the liver out, you get the fat tail and you shake it all about. Um, because it all seems so otherworldly. So I was glad to read Simon's next instruction, which was, it's a long chapter, so it would be good if we had a portion of it for our reading. 
Now, I don't mean to be disrespectful to Scripture, but in our time and place, this all sounds pretty gross, doesn't it? Um, and though I hasten to add that this passage is, is packed with meaning, uh, it's tough. But there's a lot of ritual here. And the truth is that um, I have trouble keeping up to date with ritual. I was saying in Gollingstown that I had trouble keeping up with the coronation last Saturday, never mind all of this, um, all of the ritual and all of the, the, the costume changes that the king had and so forth. So for that reason, I didn't choose a text for this morning's service. Fortunately, because I wouldn't have been preaching all those things materialized. Um, some clergy, especially in the past and, and other sort of aspects of service, they go for dynamic titles for their sermon. And um, I, um, I, I thought about that as well. I wasn't going to get a text, text so what about, I wasn't going to get a text, so what about a, a title? And in view of the way things went this morning, I was thinking that I should call this uh, McReynolds Unfinished Sermon, not Schubert's Unfinished Symphony, but an unfinished sermon. But I'm giving you another one just to try to keep you alert, because you'll, you'll have to listen right to the end to hear what it's all about. I could say the title for my sermon this morning is The Priest and a Pie. Does that get your interest? No? Okay, right, forget about it. Um, but um, I'll come back to, 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 to that. But just to remind you before getting into today's reading that the three previous chapters uh, in, in Exodus, uh, Moses is instructed about the construction uh, of the tabernacle, that elaborate tent which the people could dismantle and move about with them in their long trek in the wilderness, uh, and in which they could worship and the priests could offer sacrifices and, and so forth. A special sacred meeting place with God. And the instructions were all very precise uh, in Exodus, especially in relation to the measurements of the, the tabernacle and the various furnishings and the, the fabrics and materials that were to be used and so forth. And then in chapter 28, Moses is instructed to, to have special clothing made as well uh, for the high priest and, and the other priests. And finally, in verse 41 of chapter 28, we read these words. After you put these clothes on your brother Aaron and his sons, anoint them uh, and ordain them. Consecrate them so that they might serve me as priests. And that's what we've been reading about in our Bible reading this morning. Now, I, I've always had a bit of an, a, an interest, to put it crudely, in the whole tabernacle theme, the layout uh, and, and the various aspects to the building, especially as it reached its ultimate fulfillment in the, in the great temple of Jerusalem. Uh, built by her to um, appease his, his Jewish subjects. Um, and interestingly, the temple in Jerusalem, it retained many of the instructions about the layout and, and so forth uh, that were given to Moses at the Exodus. And indeed, um, the, temp the temple sacrificial system with, with all its various types of blood sacrifices and, and feast days and so forth. They have a lot to tell us about the heart and mind of God uh, for his people. For those of us who have benefit of outsight, hindsight, we also know that it was all a, a kind of a foretaste, um, uh, an archetype of what was to come in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Not on the altars of Israel, but on the cross outside the city walls, where the dear Lord was crucified, who died to save us all. Now, this was uh, a sacrifice for all time. It wasn't just to, uh, an, an appeasement for God, but this was a time when God accepted the sacrifice of his son, whereby you and I can be made nothing less than children of the Most High God, children of God. What a calling is that? I love the verse from John 1. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of uh, a husband's will or human decision, but born of God. So we're not just called to be followers. We're not called to be members of a particular church. We're not even just called to be disciples. We're called to be members of God's family, and that is, a, ah boy, that is such a, a calling. 
And it's, it's such a, a great calling that I think it goes over our heads sometimes that truly we are called to be children of God. But as we come to chapter 29, part of which was read to us by Judith just now, I don't want to dwell so much on the grisly detail uh, of the sacrifice rit- ritual that they were engaged in, uh, but to highlight the importance of that which was a, a demonstrated, illustrated, imparted, expressed, call it what you will, because this was a foreshadow of the greatest event in the history of the world. We cannot lose sight of that. It, there was purpose to it all. There was important biblical teaching here, and that found ultimate expression, of course, in the sacrifice of Golgotha, where the Lord Jesus stretched out his arms and offered for us all our sin, all our filth, all our feelings, that we might become children of the Most High God. The dear Lord was crucified, the hymn writer tells us. He died to save us all. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. He only could unlock the gate of heaven and let us in. What a gift! What an inheritance. So, I, at least if you'd asked me on, on yesterday morning, I'd have said that I, I picked out three aspects of this sermon in the order that they're uh, revealed to us in our reading. First, from verse 4, that the, the Aaron and, and his sons were uh, washed. They were anointed in verse 7, and then verse 21, they were consecrated. All great aspects of this wonderful ceremony. So we're taking our eyes off the the mechanics of the rituals, uh, just to see what God is saying to us, what he is doing, and and to learn something more about the heart of God, the redemptive purposes that God has for all humankind. And the first aspect of these events, of course, are recorded in verse 4. They they bring Aaron and his sons to the entrance to the camp of meeting and wash them with water. They are washed, made clean. We can, we can understand that concept. Now, we have to assume that this was basically a ceremonial cleansing. Aaron and his sons probably weren't put in, in some kind of see-through swimming pool where they could paddle about and be washed from head to foot and play about. But this basin that they were, they were uh, washed in, uh, we, we do read that... Uh, the Lord said to Moses, make a bronze basin and its bronze, with its bronze scan for washing. Place it between the tent of making and the altar and put water in it. Aaron and his sons are to wash their hands and feet with water from it. Whenever they enter the tent of making, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, where they, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and their feet. I think that um, a, um, this, this is a very important part of the sermon. Now, this basin that the International Version of the Bible speaks of uh, is referred to in some of the older translations as the, the laver. But it's basically uh, this sort of like a huge baptismal font. Um, and unlike all the other fixtures in the temple, there are no, there are no measurements uh, mentioned about how big or how small it's going to be. But um, I can't imagine that was a sort of a, a huge baptismal font. And I say huge, probably even more huge in the Jerusalem temple than it was in, 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 the, in the tabernacle. But um, with this image of, of whatever form it took, we, we have this clearly in our mind that when Aaron and his sons uh, went into that ceremony, they were immediately confronted with their need to be washed. They were immediately confronted with their sin. Now, obviously, however it was carried out, there was a ceremonial aspect to it. Um, but they needed, and they were being conscious that they needed, a, a, a cleaning, a washing away of their impurities. That could be symbolized by washing in, 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 in the lava or in the basin, but could only be affected by God. And I want you to imagine this. Supposing I had um, come into church in Marilyn this morning and late, but you know, we have a service first and I enjoyed a cup of coffee and a chat before I left, which I probably shouldn't have. But um, I want you to imagine I came in and uh, I'm filthy dirty. I look like I'm just coming out of a swamp. 
And as I was preparing this, I thought, well, that actually describes our garden at the moment. It really is a swamp. But the, I'm wearing a, a pair of filthy Wellingtons, and the soil is dripping off them all over your lovely carpet. And my trousers and coat are so dirty that everything I brush against, and every body I brush against, I leave a trail of dirt behind me. And um, I smell. And I go to shake hands with the church wardens or, or the rector. And I'm a huggy person as well. And I, I can imagine Simon saying, Hey, bro, <laughs> I think you need a bit of it. Does he call you, bro? Uh, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know what he calls those of you who are ladies, but I love the way he calls me, bro. I think I do, anyway. Um, you need a bit of a clean-up. Wardens, get this man to somewhere where he can wash and, and have a bit of a change. He wouldn't want to preach like that. And I get that because you wouldn't want me to be standing up here like that either. But folks, what I really want to ask you this morning is how do you think I would feel if, if Simon or Cosman or any of this, if, if any of you knew exactly what I'm like inside, but could see past the filth of my clothing into the innermost parts of my being and see in precise detail all of my failures. And geek, how do you feel just now as I remind you in God's house this morning that God can see you like an open book? The person we see in one another, that's not what God sees. God sees right into every crevice in our heart and being. He sees uh, every wrong motive. He sees every uh, twinge of jealousy, every immoral thought, uh, every careless word that we've uttered, every time we've shown a lack of compassion this week, we've been self-interested, uh, the lack of time that we spent alone with God uh, in, in prayer, all these missed opportunities to, to serve God and to love him and to worship and to live for him. And you know and I know that these things, though not necessarily terrible in the eyes of mankind, but they're inconsistent with the pure Son of God who is in us by his Holy Spirit. The two just don't marry. Do you feel your need of washing in the basin, metaphorically speaking, this morning? Do you feel that perhaps you need cleansing before even you continue with the rest of this service? Now, I'm not calling, when I say this, I'm not calling into question your salvation. Uh, we were saved by grace. We all know that. But I'm just reminding you that we continue to live for grace. And if you forget that, then that's a very serious matter. And here I veer from what I was intending uh, to say, and I shared something in, in Dolling's King as well. Because I believe that God obviously has placed within the, my, my hearing this morning someone or some who perhaps need to hear what I want to share f for you. And apart from Dolling's Town this morning, I'm not sure that I might have, but I'm not sure that I ever shared these things anywhere before. And so it's difficult and it's personal. I struggled so much in my childhood and youth with the fact that though I had invited Jesus into my heart as Savior when I was about seven or eight or so, no one but no one ever mentioned or talked about dealing with sin as a Christian. I remember hearing verses like 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Usually quoted in isolation. But what was happening when in my life, some of the old things didn't seem to have passed away. Everything didn't become new, at least not for long. Now, I was a good child. Believe me, in our Christian home, you didn't have any choice. You were a good child. But despite all of that, I felt hopelessly condemned. And I don't think that it was just because I was a child and I didn't understand everything. I think that perhaps God is saying that there's someone in our parishes this morning you too feel at times to be condemned. I'm quite ashamed and embarrassed to share this, um, and you'll be shocked, but by the time 
I was at secondary school, I had actually murdered two people. Now, the reason Cosman hasn't fallen off his seat is because he heard me share this in Gollingstown, and actually I didn't. But I sure brought you back. <laughs> I can see your mind. <laughs> what is he saying? Um, and it also helps to lighten the mood for me because I find it difficult uh, to share some of these things. But uh, I can remember um, when I would be perhaps at school, very often in school, and I would remember something that was wrong, that it was sinful, it was punishable by God in the fires of hell, and I would immediately feel so burdened, and I clasped my hands over my face, and I cried out to God to forgive me. Now, I did this so often that some of the other children actually noticed me do this. And I can clearly remember one morning, one of the boys in the front row turning saying, Hey, look at my grounds, he's doing that again. What's he about? Boy, if they had known, I would have been so teased and so persecuted. You see, no one told me that the same man who wrote about all things becoming new and all things being passed away also wrote these words from Romans 7 on his struggle. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. What I hate to do, I do. He continues, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. A hard one to read, Doug, if you're ever allocated that Bible reading. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind. What a wretched man I am, he concludes. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he finishes that particular section. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, friends, as long as these new, as long as we live these born again lives, as, as long, even as Christ within us, um, and, and we're, we're called to live a new life and so forth. But as long as that new life is housed in these human, sinful, mortal bodies and we reside in this sinful world, there is going to be, this side of eternity, a struggle going on. And that struggle is a healthy struggle because it bears testimony to the fact that we have chosen not to live for the devil, but to live for God. And it is a struggle. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world. The new us is opposing the old flesh. And the day that you think you've got it all sorted, that sin isn't a problem for you, that God is so pleased with your life, is the day when the devil himself is drawing near to the doorway of your soul. Now, what I'm trying to say here, it, it doesn't either constitute an excuse for careless living, I'll fail God anyway, so what's the point in trying, or indeed a spirit of defeatism. It's a foregone conclusion. I'm, I'm not going to manage it, so why bother trying? Some people think that there are certain people in their lives, in the life of the church, who seem to have it all together. They don't struggle with sin. They never feel unworthy. They're happy, bubbly, rejoicing in the Lord, full of the joy of their salvation. I'll never be like that. Well, I won't either. And the trouble is, do you know what happens when we think like that? We subconsciously embrace the curse of the church, and that is nominal Christianity we begin to accept that a lot of what we teach and practice in our churches is theory. Good theory, but far from reality. And it certainly won't give you that kind of faith, that joyful assurance of Christ's presence in your life, a warmth in your heart when you think of him, a peace coming from the fact that you know in him you're accepted by God and your sins forgiven, that you are not condemned, but you settle for this option 
that we'll do our best, but we're not really meant to live victorious lives like that. My mother used to say, blessed are those who expect of little, for they shall not be disappointed. And if you live like that, you won't be disappointed. But brothers and sisters, God wills for much better than your life. And God's grace provides for much better in your life. In John 4, we read a well-known story about Jesus uh, asking a, a, a woman at the well for a drink. And, and you know the conversation that, that uh, ensued. And, and uh, she'd been living a sinful life. And Jesus, to her amazement, knew all about that. And, and she said, I, I can see you're a prophet. So, if you are a prophet, you tell me this. And she raised a thorny issue about where was the right place to worship. The Gentiles thought it would be probably somewhere like Mount Gershom. The Jews were teaching that it was in Jerusalem. So, so she said, if you're a prophet, you tell me. Now, the church faces many issues today, some of them petty, some of them real. But here's what Jesus said on this occasion. He said, woman, we wouldn't address our wives like that, I don't think I guess, or anybody wouldn't say, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Rather, a time is coming, indeed it has now come, when true worshippers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. God is Spirit, Jesus said, and those who worship him must worship in Spirit and in truth. Doesn't matter where that worship takes place, doesn't matter how we may appear to our fellow worshippers. Doesn't matter how we look on the outside this morning or what people think of us. Our unholy lives are the problem inside. And God wants our worship today to rise up from humble, grateful, pure hearts to a spiritual realm. And he wants that to be in the spirit of total honesty. He wants us to worship in spirit and in truth, with integrity. I'm sure that in going back to Exodus 29, as I do remember a view from time to time, that as Aaron and the sons did as they were requested to do and had water poured over them, however, wherever that took place, that that was a timely reminder to Aaron of his impurity that he needed to be clean to exercise his ministry. People would be coming to, to him with their sins. He was in need of that washing. So what I'm very humbly suggesting this morning, brothers and sisters, is this. Some of us may feel we need to be washed afresh this morning before we even continue with this service, before it comes to an end and we go home. You need to visit in your hearts that basin of washing, of cleansing. Not to have some physical dirt washed away from us that we didn't notice when we looked in the bathroom mirror this morning, but to be cleaned and cleansed by God. We don't want to be symbolically cleaned up a bit. We want to the, the cleansing blood of Jesus to pour over every crevice of our heart and our life. And as we, act, as we continue to engage in this act of worship this morning, that we might be doing so with a cleansed and pure heart, offering to God the totality of our being in spirit and in truth, not in how we look to others, not in what people think of us, but as God sees us. We want to be cleansed afresh. Eliza Hoffman, a Presbyterian minister in the United States of America, who died almost 100 years ago, but he penned some lovely hymns, and I'm sure you recognize some of them, like, What a Wonderful Saviour is Jesus my Lord, leaning on the everlasting arms. There's no other friend like Jesus. But I'm sure that many of you remember this old gospel hymn. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless or the white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Saviour's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you feel each moment, do you live, rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? I think that's the final verse that says, Lay aside the garments that are skimmed by sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Maybe some of you this morning sometimes feel like I did. Oh God. Oh God. I'm a failure. Because you see, I thought it was now up to me. Yes, I was saved by grace, but I thought, now this is where I take over and live consistent with my new profession. I didn't know that we lived our lives daily by the grace of God. It wasn't just up to me. And as far as the, the Holy Ghost is concerned, it was just part of a blessing that I was familiar with. I didn't know about the presence of the Holy Spirit within us to help us in our struggles and to empower us. In Aaron's case, he didn't have any option but to go through the sermon. Because after all, he was Moses' elder brother and now a high priest. He had to practice what he preached. And if God had told his brother this was what he must do, then this was what he must do. But my guess is that Aaron, as he entered the temple to fulfill his priestly duties and saw that large basin, perhaps like a large baptismal font. He thought, gosh, am I worthy of this role? Oh God, make me as you want me to be. Cleanse me, wash me. He would have known as you and I know in our hearts that in order to join fully and meaningfully into the sacrifice of worship, to feel like intimacy with God, we can have no barriers in our hearts between us and God. More than likely, we will need a spiritual washing. And we can have it. Because not only, as I said, are we saved by grace, but we live by grace and we walk by grace. And so by grace this morning, we can approach the Savior afresh. And this is where I have a decision to make because I told you earlier that there were three aspects of our reading and, and at this stage the congregation in Gollingstown were getting visibly concerned because they knew I'd just finished the first one and we had our communion service. Well, as I said, that is the, the, the first point and that's the bad news. But I did tell you also that it might be McGrillan's unfinished sermon. But there is one thing that God also laid on my heart that I should share with you this morning. And it is important for us because, you see, the purpose of this particular ceremony that Aaron and his brothers were being prepared for and, and, and the children of Israel would be that they were to be consecrated as priests. Now, of course, that concept doesn't affect us, does it? Except that I just want to remind you that it very much does. Because in this new covenant era, you and I, all of us, who have been saved through the blood of Christ, have become and are called to be priests of the Most High God. We don't have to offer sacrifices as, as Aaron and, and subsequent priests did because the, the blood of the perfect spotless Lamb of God was offered as a once-for-all sacrifice that was complete, was redeeming, was an act whereby we would be God's children, those who are trusting Christ for salvation. But I'm sure, nevertheless, that you understand that we are called to be priests. You're familiar with those words from 1 Peter 2. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house 
a living temple to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So my question is very simple, as I draw, thankfully, you'll think to a close. Do you see yourself as a priest? Did you expect to be called a priest this morning? Cosmon sees me as being a super priest without introduction. And I guess you'll have no, no bother seeing perhaps the clergy staff or others that we greatly admire as priests. But what about you? You are called to a holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Now, I know I don't need to dwell on that too much, so um, God had me scrap it. And I know that most of you understand the concept of the priesthood of all believers. And I know that you also understand uh, the concept of body ministry, the concept whereby we're all called to, to minister as priests, but not all with the same calling. And we're lacking to the human body. If I uh, approach a tree with a, a low-hanging branch, a signal will go to my head and I'll duck. A signal, another signal will go to my eyes and I'll close. My eyelids will come down and I will close to protect me. Another signal will go to my arm and I'll protect myself from the branch. All of these working in my body and yet no one can see those signaling systems. They're invisible. And yet how powerful they are. And how powerful your ministry is before God. doesn't have to be standing up here doing something wonderful or visible. It can be very, very invisible. And I know that in this parish, this concept of ministry is encouraged perhaps more so than the majority of churches. And I thank God that I found myself here in retirement when people are seeing and encouraged to see their priestly role in Christ. God's perfect will for you. And I don't think we can overstate this. So I leave you with this true story, and this really is the end. Some time ago, I had hip surgery. And I know that some people, when they're telling their story of surgery, they tell it in such a way that theirs was more serious than everybody else's. Their pain was more agonizing. Mine was. Oh boy, you've never had a time like I had. Actually, it wasn't a ball of laughs. I had a hip replaced that was already replaced 20 years ago. But the old hip chipped out and a new one put in and a fracture that I had changing a light bulb. Didn't get much sympathy for that. Um, all wrapped up with wire and bits and pieces, bolts and nuts and so forth. And yes, I, I wasn't a ball of laughs. But... On the morning after my surgery, there was a, an outbreak of COVID in the ward, and we were chucked out for our own safety. Now, it was all so painful, I hardly remember what it was like. I do remember that I was wheeled or pushed or led out into the pouring rain, but the porters wouldn't go any further than the edge of the curb. They said they weren't allowed to, and Dorothy was left with me, scogging or sitting or lying over something, I don't remember what in the pouring rain, intense pain, so bad I don't even remember. I don't know to this day how she got me home and settled, other than to say I was a perfect patient. Oh boy, I was such a perfect patient. It was painful, and it was not an enjoyable situation. But... About the third or fourth day after I came home, the doorbell rang and the aforesaid patient, Dorothy, was up the garden with the dogs or perhaps in the shed getting something from the chest freezer or whatever, but I decided that I would try and answer the door. So I hobbled along, uh, took a while, got there, opened the door, stepped back so that I wouldn't trip over something. And this rather pleasant lady, who I vaguely recognised from seeing around church, said to me, Mr McReynolds, uh, we understand that you've been in hospital recently and we thought that you and your wife would appreciate this. 
and she handed me this large chicken pie. It was just out of the oven. I can smell the aroma yet. And for two days from that large pie, Dorothy and I fared sumptuously. They even included an afters. So I leave you with this thought. As I opened the door that day, did I need someone to give me a tract, although I'm not knocking that? Did I need someone to give me a sermon, although I'm not knocking that? Or did I need someone to slap me in the back and say, oh, it's okay, brother. All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. Oh, I shiver when people sometimes quote that. You know what we needed that day? You guessed it. We needed a chicken pie. And no one will ever know what that did for our spirits that day. Just to be ministered to by two humble ladies who were priests of the Most High God, fulfilling their ministry. Maybe being very visible, probably nobody knew of them. But boy, it was a ministry. Fast forward a couple of months, I was in a house visiting, as many of you will know, I do some visiting for the parish, and what a privilege and honour that is. And I visited this couple, and they were actually at Gullingstown this morning, and I saw them smiling, they knew I was speaking about them. But they joined our church recently, and, and the lady said, um, my husband's brother died recently, and, and, and uh, we had a visit from Ryan come out to see us, and they lived a fair bit out of the parish, and they were, they were touched by that. And she said, but we really knew we were doing the right thing joining this church. When we noticed Ryan when he came in, he set down a bag, and I thought it was just something he had in his hand, he would pick it up on the way out. But she said, after he left, it was still there, and I looked inside. A steak pie, and an afters. I only got chicken, wonder why that was. <laughs> Folks, hence my title, Priests with a Pie. I don't know if those ladies see themselves as priests, but they were priests of God in our situation. And both of those packages contained a little card saying from Manga Ministries in this parish. People, we are blessed to have priests with pies. We are blessed to have priests with musical gifts, with, with sympathetic hearts and people who can listen and befriend and, and help and counsel and, and just do so many priestly functions. Not priestly in the sense of the high priest, but in priest, priestly sense of God's call to you to be his priest. So I just want to leave you with a challenge. Will you be a priest for God. This week, might you be the priest that someone is waiting for, looking for, needs, just like we needed, a priest with a pie. Thankfully, I wasn't called to that priesthood, or the rector would have several funerals every week. And I don't think I'll start taking cooking lessons now. But I rejoice that even I, Humble me, who at one stage felt condemned. Stand before you assured that I'm a priest of God, and so are you. God bless you. Thank you, Ken. I think I'm going to stay at four o'clock in the morning and do something similar to you, because there's a lot of craft into that. Let us stand and respond to this. Um, with this wonderful song, O Church, arise and put your arms on, your armor on. But to draw your attention, come and see the cross where love and mercy meet. Those two responses, struggling with sin while you're a Christian, or seeing yourself as the priest of God's priesthood. Let us stand and worship him as the son of God is stricken, then see his force like crushed beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. As the stone is rolled away and Christ emerges from the grave, this victory march continues to this day. Every eye and heart shall see him. Come and see. Let us stand and worship him.
Folks, lovely to see you all, and uh, just a couple of announcements before we finish up. Uh, one is that we have our welcome meal coming up. For, so for anyone who's joined our uh, church family recently, there's a welcome meal on Wednesday, the 24th of May. So if that's you, please do grab one of those. Also, if you're a, a lady and a reasonably active one, uh, on Tuesday night at half seven, uh, there's a walk at Lisburn Towpath. And uh, that's a uh, meeting in the B&Q car park at Spreesfield at 7.30. But those are little flares there as well, if anybody would like them. Uh, folks, I, I have two wee things to say about weddings. One is, I'll never forget, uh, we had a wedding here uh, for uh, our own youth worker, Richard. And he married Kate. And because Kate was from Emmanuel, we had a kind of uh, melded service between Emmanuel and, and Marilyn and all that sort of stuff. And it was at the meal and uh, Stevie Little got up to his speech and he thanked Pastor uh, Phil and Pastor uh, Dave and Father Simon. So I was very <laughs> pleased, I'm very pleased about that. But a wee reminder that we're all priests. We're all priests and we can all serve. And we've already heard about the wonderful ministry of Mana Ministries. But we also have so many others we couldn't even begin to, to mention uh, who serve. But I want to embarrass one particular person this morning because uh, I actually had to go the whole way to Wexford to pick up uh, this uh, prize. Uh, and it's that Jamie Houghton uh, won second, well, now, runner-up uh, for the, the whole Church of Ireland for designing our parish magazine. Now, the only reason why he didn't win, before you clap, 
is because the articles were too short. And I was thinking, well, the sermons definitely aren't here too short when I preach, but the articles are too short. So that's Jamie. All we'll have to do to win is make the, the articles longer. I don't think anybody wants us to do that. But Jamie's going to come forward here and receive this prize. I think it might be a trip to Disneyland, actually, uh, but I haven't opened it yet. So Jamie, come forward. Be embarrassed. Everyone will clap and cheer for you. guy what a guy um now folks uh, a few things tonight's service at uh, half past six uh, my other story about about a wedding is that there was a wedding not very long ago of, of uh, emma uh, and now emma must be referred to as the reverend gibson uh, so welcome back to emma and uh, congratulations to you give her a round of applause for her. Might as well keep going now folks just before we have our closing prayer uh, we've had a wonderful challenge here to exercise ministry, and there's a, there's a wonderful opportunity to do it uh, just in the coming weeks. Uh, we have, uh, in the second week of June, uh, a group coming over uh, from all parts of the world. I think we'll have Africans and Americans among us, which is wonderful. Uh, and they're called a SOMA team, a sharing of ministries abroad team. And these wonderful people have paid their own money to fly across the world to come and help us with some activities in our parish that are all to do with reaching out to our, our own community. So it's wonderful to have them. We're going to have our uh, SOMA team coming in, which I'm, I'm not quite sure how many are coming, but there's somewhere, somewhere between three and seven people. There's certainly seven different individuals coming at different times, and they're going to come between the 9th and the 14th of June. And it's so wonderful to have them. And we've got all sorts of activities planned. But what I would love you to do is to just put a particular mark in your diary for the 10th of June, okay, for the 10th of June. Now, on the 10th of June, we're going to have, uh, well, I don't know if any of our Mariah Carey fans, shake your head if you want to be cool, shake your head wildly, but she once sang a song called One Sweet Day by Boys to Men. Who's sad enough to know that song, One Sweet Day by Boys to Men? Well, we're going to have One Sweet Day. Because I've been really taken by that beautiful uh, story in Exodus. Uh, not so much Exodus 29 with all the uh, blood and guts and all that. But uh, I think it's Exodus about 17, I think. And Exodus 17 has the story of coming up, uh, thirsty people coming up to bitter water in the wilderness. And the Lord making it sweet. We have a, a God who makes bitter things sweet. And we're going to have one sweet day because we're going to go uh, into our community and we're going to share the sweetness of the Lord. Now, the way we're going to do that, there's, there's, I suppose, in a sense, three things that, that there's a little opportunity if you'd like to sign up to this morning, is that you might like to do uh, w what we would call door-to-door. -door. Now, door-to-door -door would be a little bit different, okay? But when we say we're going to go door-to-door, -door, we'll be going door-to-door -door with some honeycomb. Okay, so it might be some honeycomb, like crunchies, or for adults, it'll be some lovely bags of honeycomb, uh, Foster's honeycomb. Uh, and it basically, we'll go around and we'll just tell people we want to bring some sweetness into their homes this day. And we'd also love to pray for them. Anything better going on in their lives, we'd love to pray for them. And, and if you're willing to do that, which I know sounds scary, but I prayed for 15 people from each church. We already have 47 this morning, okay, who are up for doing this. Um, so hopefully we'll have at least 15 this morning from, from our service here now who will go door to door and there will be training. You'll feel totally prepared to do that task. And I can't wait to do it, actually. Um, so we're going to be doing that. There'll also be, we need a team that we're willing to pray so we want people that are, or would tick that wee box to pray on that day for this uh, little outreach. And the third thing is, now Eileen's going to be shaking her head and, and, and sweating at the back there because she's put a lot of thinking into this with, with, with three others as well. Um, but we're also going to have, uh, in each village, hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll have a, a place where we'll have sweet treats for people to come in and have a cup of tea and some nice buns. And we'll have, probably have, hopefully, a barbecue spot as well in each village as well, just to gather a little bit of community and we'll pray the weather is a bit better than it is today. So that will be, I suppose, if you want to tick the practical box, some other, something other practical things. So three options, door to door, uh, taking on the burden to pray, 
or uh, doing some of those practical things, maybe working a barbecue or, or serving tea or something. We love the priests of this parish to exercise their priestly ministry, maybe even with a pay. So please do just take a wee moment there to, to sign that before we stand up and leave our service. But folks, uh, what a wonderful message we've heard today. What a wonderful challenge we've heard today that it's not just sermons uh, and, and books we need, but also recipe books and practical uh, acts of service too. Let's just have a closing prayer and then we'll hopefully take time to sign up. O oh Lord, we cannot measure your love nor ever count your blessings. We thank you for all your goodness, for in our weakness you make us strong. In our darkness, you give us light, and in our sorrows, you give us comfort and peace. Lord, open our eyes to see what is beautiful. Open our minds to know what is true, and our hearts to love what is good. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Amen, amen. Right, well, we'll sing a wee song. Let, let's sing the first verse. Sorry, Sarah, I'm giving you extra work here. Let's sing the first verse, just as we're seated of that last beautiful song. And then uh, hopefully this wee uh, sign-up sheet will travel around. And if you can sign it, that would be wonderful. And uh, we'll see you outside. <laughs>